Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views. You guys are my low-def but live people. Hello. If you're not watching live, then you might want to go to this camera, which is going to be posted at TheMediaSpeaks.com, and there you will see the high-def version of it. You know, in case you don't like looking up my nose here at the webcam, for those of you that do like looking up my nose, welcome to today's show as well. Um, guys, I've been getting a lot of traffic, and everyone's talking about the uh, the amnesty, the creeping over the border, and it's supposed to be okay situation that we have going on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and stay with it. And uh, one second, Serena. Well, I think my H deaf people don't have any volume, so it might only be you low deaf guys. Anyway, exclusive uh, Senator Jeff Sessions, pro-amnesty elites treat people as commodities. Um, Christelle, I'm not sure we have audio on this camera, on the HDF. While she gets that rendered, which I will edit later, there's, there's a notion that if you're against people, there we are. Wrong hole. That's what I usually say. All right, guys, uh, high deaf people, hello, low deaf people, we got everything running like we're supposed to. Um, it's somehow considered racist if you are against people breaking into your country. I'm not really sure how that is, but somehow it is. So, we got Sessions here with what seems like a really good idea. Jeff Sessions, pro-amnesty elite street people as commodities. They're using the... Mexicans and I and I, the the I should say Latinos they are using these people like commodities. Oh well, let's give the Mexicans jobs that nobody else will take. Let's give it to the people of Guatemala. Let them pick apples. That's what corporate America is saying. It, it said that is racist. Okay, not wanting to keep the jobs in America for Americans. That's not racist. That just means that you love your country. And again, for those of you new to the show, long-time listeners, bear with me for a sentence. I think it should be cheaper and easier to get into the country legally. We should not have to have you buying your way into the country. Having said that, yes, you should learn English, at least conversationally. I don't expect you to be fluid. I don't even expect you to speak it usually. But enough to get by, I'm happy. Um... And you, sh you should work when you get here. I mean, again, you don't have to be a CEO. Work. Work somewhere. If you do those two things, I don't have a problem with it. But we want to know who you are. We want to know where you came from. And, you know, the basic things that most people want before someone comes into their house. Breitbart.com, which has an annoying, annoying pop-up player. If you look this article up, you're going to be very angry. Perhaps no issue better illustrates the current divide between everyday citizens and our political and business elites than the issue of immigration. The latter group draws the financial gains from a generous labor supply without considering the perspective of those on the other side of the ledger, the working people who have to worry about being laid off and replaced with lower wage workers about the strain placed on the local hospitals and neighborhood resources and about cartel violence spilling across the border and into our communities. Did you pay attention to that paragraph? Now, at no point did it say, we don't want uh, dark-skinned uh, Latinos here because we hate dark-skinned Latinos. We do not want to be displaced in our job. We do not want the other people who are here legally from Latino countries to lose their jobs due to illegal Latinos. How's that for another way to put it? Um, we don't want strain put on our hospitals because we don't send people away. And again, I mean, I'm, a, I'm as much of a humanitarian as anyone, but they can't pay for anything in many instances when they come here illegally. Am I talking about their color? No. I'm talking about anybody that breaks into another country is probably broke or on the run or got both or about the cartel violence spinning into the border of our communities. Again, this is not like the people breaking into the country are the best and brightest. It's, and very, 
in many instances, these are 16, 17-year-old gangsters. Cholos, as they like to be called for some dumb reason. It goes on, for instance, Sheldon Adelson recently wrote that the immigrants here legally need jobs. Repeat, the immigrants here legally, who I support with every fiber of my being, need jobs, want to work, and are willing to take jobs that are not appealing to many Americans. What about Americans who need jobs? Human beings are not commodities. We need to get our own workers off of unemployment and into good paying jobs, that means stop outsourcing, that can support their families. That means if a job is hard or strenuous, employees should raise the wages and improve the working conditions. Why shouldn't Americans who do a tough work get paid more for their efforts? That is a beautiful, beautiful paragraph. This guy should get like the journalism gold award of the year. Rupert Murdoch also recently argued for a dramatic expansion of the controversial H-1B guest worker program. Murdoch writes that there is a shortage of qualified American candidates to fill STEM fields like computer services and engineering. Pause. I have a computer-related degree. I am a Photoshop wizard. Um, I can. I know. I'm basic web design, not programming. I'm not a programmer. Basic web design. I know how to do it. And on and on and on. I know PowerPoint, Word, or I can make uh, resumes. Blah 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 blah. I have an IMT job, and I know that there aren't any jobs available for anyone. So don't say that there aren't enough people in America who are qualified, because I graduated with a whole bunch of them. Am I using my degree? Yeah, but not in the way you think I would. Uh, I'm a DJ, and the, uh, I'm the only one there that knows how to program a light board. I'm the only one that has any idea what to do when a computer dies. Uh, me and one other manager. So I mean... I use it, but not in any way that I ever foreshadowed, no. It says, the evidence shows the opposite. The U.S. graduates approximately twice as many STEM-trained students each year as there are STEM jobs to fill. There is a large surplus of unemployed Americans with STEM degrees, and yet the Economic Policy Institute says the annual inflow of guest workers amount to one-third to one-half of all new IT job holders. In other words, they're getting between half and a third of all the jobs that people here are in fact trained to do. As Reuters professional Hal Salzman poignantly asked, average wages in IT today are the same as they were when Bill Clinton was president well over a decade. Again, I have experience in this. It's true. If there is, in fact, a shortage, why doesn't that reflect the market? Why, does, why don't wages go up? Very true. The United States has the most genuine immigration policy in the world. Each year, the U.S. grants permanent legal admission to an additional 1 million immigrants who will be able to apply for citizenship, along with roughly 700,000 guest workers and 200,000 200, relatives of guest workers and 500,000 students. That's hardly a racist country. These are overwhelmingly not farm workers, as activists falsely suggest, but are instead workers brought in to fill jobs in every sector, occupation, and industry throughout the U.S. economy. You want some more of my insight? I can tell you firsthand from being there. When I was going through college and going through a separation, I needed any work I could find. So, thankfully, some immigrants, and they were legal, found me a uh, job working with them and they were filling cement in a basement. We were there for 12 and a half hours. <laughs> they paid us $120 a piece. So don't tell me they're not hosing the immigrants because I know that they are. What that's doing is driving down everything for everyone else. We are not helping them. We are exploiting them so that the richest among us can pay as little as possible. That is not a racist issue. 
friends, go ahead and look up the rest of this, but that's the nuts and bolts of that article. It's been trending very high. You guys have wanted me to cover more of it, so I did. Uh, PrisonPlanet.com, it's actually a Zero Hedge article. It's just up on Prison Planet. The U.S. healthcare system, most expensive yet worst in the developed world. Well, the reason I said that was because it's Prison Planet. They don't like Prison Planet. So I cover many different news sites, many different sources. Zero Hedge. I happen to like Prison Planet, by the way. One month ago, we showed that when it comes to the cost of basic and not-so-basic health insurance, the U.S. is by far the most expensive country in the world, and certainly among its most wealthy nation peers in a world in which indebtedness is somehow equivalent to wealth, which in the context of the irreversible social socialization of American health care was in line with expectations. That's a very overly wordy way of saying Obamacare is going to make an already bad situation worse. It would be logical then to think that the result of this premium, the biggest in the world, the quality of health care offered in the U.S. would be among the best, if not the best in the world. Unfortunately, that would be wrong, and in fact, the reality is more of the complete opposite. As a recent study by the Commonwealth Fund, for those of you that say that I don't give sources, looking at how the U.S. healthcare system compares internationally finds, quote, the U.S. fails to achieve better health outcomes than the other countries, and as shown in earlier editions, the U.S. is last or near last on dimensions of access, efficiency, and equality. In other words, most expensive yet worst in the developed world. Um, look at this list, guys. Who's, who's better than us? The UK, Switzerland, Sweden, Australia, Germany, the Netherlands, Gabber, New Zealand, Norway, France, Canada, US dead last. Uh, who are we beating here? Afghanistan, Ethiopia, uh, Russia. Well, most people freeze to death in Russia, so that if they were in our climate, who knows? Friends, I can tell you again from first-hand experience, I was married to somebody with Crohn's disease that used to get very good health care at the Cleveland Clinic. Years later, that care looked like it was going down the drain. Me and this person separated, no longer together. Years later, my dad goes to the Cleveland Clinic and gets some of the absolute worst health care that I have ever seen. The bedside manner was that of a, a zookeeper. It was a nightmare, and of course, he died. Um, you could argue that he waited a little long. I've gone into it on the air before. I'm not going to again. My mom has seen the worst health care every time that she's not in Timken Mercy, Mercy Hospital. They've been doing all well this time. Uh, Mercy again. Mercy Hospital sent my father home with his gallbladder not showing up, and then never followed up at all. Nothing, not a word, nothing, at zero. They, they killed the man is what they did. Mercy Hospital killed my dad. Boom. Well, unfortunately, my mom is in this hellhole now, but they're actually doing really well with her. But the assisted care center that she lived in has allowed her to get a urinary tract infection because they don't know what they're doing. Now, friends, Anybody with an ounce of common sense knows that if your urine looks like Thousand Island dressing, as my brother is prone to say, then that's a sign that you might have a UTI. I mean, you really got to be a doctor here. Nope, they didn't catch it. So, I mean, I can tell you, and I can go on and on and on and on, but I can see, you know, and those that don't watch the show are like, so I'm going to go back into the news, but I'm, I'm reinforcing the news. I'm telling you from firsthand experience, and like I said, I could go on and on. Our healthcare system has crashed in the last 15 or 20 years, and I've seen it happen. It says the United States healthcare system is the most expensive in the world, but this report and prior editions consistently show that the U.S. underperforms relative to other countries on most dimensions of performance. Most troubling, the U.S. fails to achieve better health outcomes than other countries. And as shown in the earlier editions, the U.S. is last or near last in dimensions, dimensions of access, can you get to it or not, efficiency, um, how prompt, how good is it, how, how reliable is it. 
Um, are they doing things the best way possible? And equity. In addition of Mira Mira, the United Kingdom ranks first, followed closely by Switzerland. In other words, our outcomes are worse than any other country in the developed world. The U.S. also ranks behind most countries on measures of health outcomes, quality, and efficiency. U.S. physicians face particular difficulties receiving timely information, coordinating care, and dealing with administrative hassles, and yet we're the most expensive in the developed world. That's wonderful news, isn't it? Um, friends, this is also Zero Heads, June 19th. I'm going to be doing a massive Fukushima update very, very soon. Um, once a month I do it, but I always say to my regular uh, listeners, when you hit subscribe, you get a little bit more. I pepper Fukushima throughout the month, and I'm going to do a quick one now. Uh, Japan's plan to freeze Fukushima's with an ice wall is melting down. We've been following this since day one, and of course it's going as bad as people said. For those of you that don't know, they, uh, they've taken the perimeter of the Fukushima and attempting to align, uh, put an ice wall around it so that they can prevent the water from flowing into the ocean. This has been used in limited scope for things like a subway construction. Never has anything that is meant to last this long and is this big ever even been dreamed of. Who could possibly have foreseen this, it mockingly writes. A year ago, we wished TEPCO with a link. The best of luck with the construction of the Game of Thrones-esque 1.4-kilometer giant wall of ice that was designed to surround the exploded Fukushima power plant and slow the movement of irradiated water below the damaged reactors, preventing it from flowing over into the ocean and surrounding land. A plan so idiotic we were at a loss for words trying to even list the ways that it could go wrong. We didn't bother with how it could get right because it clearly couldn't. Love the way they write. Um, it lists a graph showing exactly how it works for those of you that want to follow what I'm talking and haven't heard of it. And as it turns out, making a project, it says, overly complicated and ridiculous doesn't assure it to be a success. Quite the contrary. As Japan JIJI reports, TEPCO said the project, which remains in its early stages, is experiencing a problem with an inner ice wall designed to contain highly radioactive water that is draining from the basements of the wrecked reactors. A TEPCO, TEPCO spokesman added that we have yet to form an ice plug because we can't get the temperature down low enough to freeze the water. Oh, you mean to say that he, that the plan to that the plan whose success relies on freezing water may fail because it is impossible to get the water to freeze. Truly, some of the smartest Japanese scientists must have been behind this brilliant strategy, or at least those who were not involved in the planning of BOJ's QE program, of course. Nice. Um, it says the underlying idea was simple enough on paper. Trenches are being dug for a huge network of pipes under the plant that will have refrigerant pumped through them. If successful, it would freeze the soil and form a physical barrier, significantly slowing the rate of which uncontaminated groundwater flows into reactor basements and becomes contaminated. Alas, the reality is proving to be far more complicated than theory. Just ask the Fed. The idea of freezing a section of ground was proposed last year. Engineers have used the technique to build tunners, tunnels near water courses, but scientists point out that it's never been used on such a large scale or for the length of time that TEPCO is proposing. Coping with a large amount of water at the plant is proving to be a major challenge for TEPCO as it tries to clean up the mess after the worst nuclear disaster in a generation. I'll make that ever. As well as having to collect vast quantities of water used to cool the melted reactor, TEPCO has been pumping water and storing it in drains down from the inland mountains and into the sea. Full decommissioning of the plant is expected to take several decades. It says, in conclusion, we are behind schedule but have already taken additional measures, including putting in more pipes so that we can remove contaminated water from the trench starting next month, a spokesman said. Keep in mind that you can't even go near the water in some instances, and we don't have the robot technology yet to do it, so I'd like to see what their other plan is. Wait, wasn't the issue with the temperature of the water and not the number of pipes? Oh, who cares anyway, as long as someone pretends that everything is going to be okay and going to work to some fix the world's worst nuclear accident in history, having long since surpassed Chernobyl in severity. 
one can't have the locals realize that the government is hopeless and with and that the Fukushima situation was a complete disaster from the start and what's worth what's worse one which cannot be fixed especially now that Abenomics has failed Abe the uh, prime minister and the K is still down for the year thus not providing the required dose of distraction from the increasingly radiated life friends you're listening to the correct views I'm going to ask you to do me a favor check out my book it's called A Sleep Unknowing. You can get it on Amazon. I also have a short story up called The Lucky Leprechaun. It's only 99 cents, people. And uh, a piece that I wrote for college I decided to publish. It's called The Risen, a persuasive essay on the historicity of the resurrection. Basically, I proved that Christ rose from the dead without using the Bible to do it. Lastly, friends, check out Mike McLaughlin because he is also an amazing writer. And uh, you can find him at Facebook.com. Look up Mike McLaughlin. Short stories, poems, you name it, he sells them. And he's excellent. And he sells direct. He hasn't even done the Amazon thing yet. So support him. He's very, very good. A couple more things I want to get to. The lethality of nuclear weapons. This is somewhat long, so I'm going to let a lot of you look this up. But I want to get to the logistics of this here. It says, uh, it's from Stephen Starr. It's located at PaulCraigRoberts.com. Nuclear War has no winner. Beginning in 2006, several of the world's leading climatologists at Rutgers, UCLA, John Hopkins University, and the University of Colorado Boulder published a series of studies that evaluated long-term environmental consequences of a nuclear war, including baseline scenarios fought with merely 1%, that's one out of 100 for you Usher fans, on the explosive power in the U.S. and or Russian launch-ready nuclear arsenals. They concluded that the consequence of even a small nuclear war would include catastrophic disruptions to the global climate and massive destruction of Earth's protective ozone layer. In other words, 1% of the nuclear bombs that the U.S. and Russia has, forget North Korea and India and Pakistan, 1% of what the U.S. and Russia has basically destroy almost all life on Earth. These and more recent studies predict that global agriculture would be so negatively affected by such a war, agriculture as in food, a global famine would result, which would cause up to 2 billion people to starve to death. These peer-reviewed studies, which were analyzed by the best scientists in the world and found to be without error, also predict that a war fought with less than half of U.S. or Russian strategic nuclear weapons would utterly destroy the human race. It's not even up for question. In other words, a U.S.-Russian nuclear war would create such extreme long-term damage to the global environment that it would leave the Earth uninhabitable for humans and most forms of animal life. Um, what's scary about that? It goes on to say that many of the leading people the leaders in Congress, the leaders in the Senate, people in the Department of Defense are not familiar with this study. It mentions it in the article. It says, in 2009, I wrote an article for the International Commission on Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament that summarizes the findings in these studies. It explains that nuclear firestorms would produce millions of tons of smoke which would rise above cloud level and form a global stratospheric smoke layer that would rapidly encircle the Earth. The smoke layer would remain for at least a decade and it would act to destroy the protective ozone layer which would vastly increase the UVB reaching, reaching the Earth as well as cause a new ice age that would last for 10 years or longer. The electric magnetic pulse signals would immediately kill any generator you had stashed, even if you weren't nuked. And again, they talk about people not knowing about it. And it mentions that uh, Russia, both Russia and U.S. have 400 to 500 launch-ready ballistic missiles. That's more than 1% people. The way it would work is there's a series that are meant to go off immediately, which is vastly more than 1%. There's no way that only 1% would be launched, even if it was a limited strike, because more than 1% are programmed to go off if the other country launches. 
And again, it's a rather long article, but I've covered the most important aspects of it. And let's remember that when we're dealing with this awful mess that's looked like, like on in the Ukraine. And now the U.S. wants to start a pissing match with the, uh, the dollar. All right, guys, new .com, news .com .au. Dad in St. Louis shot dead gunman menacing his teenage daughter is seriously hurt assailant. No, but guns kill. We need more guns. A dad who saw armed robbers holding a gun to the head of his teenage daughter opened fire on the men, killing one and critically injuring the other. The incident unfolded late Monday night at St. Louis when a 17-year-old girl went outside her home to retrieve something from the car. Local Fox station Fox 4KC reported that the teen was approached by two gunmen who demanded she return to the house. When the girl's 34-year-old dad saw the men walking his daughter to the house, he grabbed a gun and opened fire, hitting both of the men. The girl's mom, also 34, opened fire but reportedly did not hit either man. The 31-year-old, named by police as Terrell Johnson, was killed at the scene. A second suspect fled the scene and was later admitted to the hospital with gunshot wounds to his chest and thighs. The 33-year-old is in critical but stable condition, police told Fox 4 Casey. So this notion that more people are hurt by gun criminals, do you know what happens if you factor out gang-related violence in this country? We're one of the most peaceful nations on earth. That's just fact, friends. I've given you the numbers on it prior. Uh, PrisonPlanet.com, this one is Paul Joseph Watson. I told you I liked him. Police to get x-ray scanner for vehicle inspections and public safety. Yeah, it's safe to x-ray somebody. A new portable backscatter device designed to perform x-rays on objects is set to be used by police departments to inspect vehicles as well as public safety, according to the company behind the new scanner. Radioactivity is deadly. Have we not covered this already? I mean, just on this show. Not to mention, it's no more than a regular x-ray. I don't know about you, but I had vertigo uh, within the last year. I got juiced. I got a CAT scan and everything because they had to rule out stroke. They had to rule out heart disease. Thank you, God. They had to rule out a number of things. I've gotten juiced for my teeth. I'm not having any more x-rays. Well, no, it's fine, Sam. The cops say you need more. Bullshit. The cops don't know your medical history, nor should they. The video for the handheld Mini-Z backscatter imaging scanner developed by American Science and Engineering, Inc., brags that it will allow operators to see more than ever in more places than ever. Yeah, they'll just scan your car and act like you're not in it. Well, we're not going to hurt you. We're just scanning the car. The x-rays bounce around you. The scanner will be used by law enforcement, first responders, border control. What border control? Event security, maritime police, and general aviation security. In other words, they'll be juicing you at all sides for every reason. In order to search for currency, drugs, and explosives, police will use the device to inspect vehicle bumpers, tires, panels, and interiors, and detect IEDs, since dogs no longer can smell explosives or drugs. According to ASNE, the scanner represents a game changer, I bet, for law enforcement and border patrol, and will be used to ensure public safety. However, the company admits the device is not designed to scan people because it emits radiation. You mark my words. They're going to scan the car with you in it. Mark my words. The technology is based on previous larger in incarnation of the x-ray scanner. Yeah, that they were uh, deployed via trucks to conduct roving scans of other vehicles on American streets and highways. They're putting it on cars to scan other cars that are driving by with people in them. Quote, the company admits the device is not designed to scan people and it emits radiation. Friends, all I can do is give you the facts. I can't make you listen to them. Last thing I want to get to, the dum de dum de dum de dum de of the day. Uh, Dunce Cap of the Month. That show's coming up uh, right after the Fukushima update. So it's going to be real busy the first of next week. Fuku's going to be big this month. All right, guys. Obama judge rules border fence racist. The Dumdy of the Day, a federal judge who won, said Dumdy of the Day, has ruled border protection negatively impacts indigenous communities and lower income minorities. In other words, these indigenous communities and lower income minorities, just because you don't want them in your country, you're racist. I don't want people sneaking into my country from Canada. They probably bring the really good weed when they do. I'm 
really, I'm being real. But no, you cannot sneak into the country. Oh, he hates French people. He hates white people. It's, no. Judge Beryl Howe appointed to the U.S. District Court of District of Columbia, and that's a sentence, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia by Obama in 2010 agreed with Denise Gilman, a clinical professor at the Texas Austin, Gilman, who is researching the human rights impact of border enforcement, sued in a federal court to force the Department of Homeland Security to reveal through a Freedom of Information Act, oh no, I'm sorry, yeah, request the names of property owners along the border to determine if fence construction would be disadvantageous to the minority property owners, Judicial Watch reported last week. In other words, if you just want to build a fence to keep illegals from coming into the country, who might be drug dealers, who might be rapists, we don't even know what their criminal background is, you're racist. Well, let me ask you something, Mr. Wise Judge, who just won the dunce cap of the day, dumb of the day. Let me ask you, is Guatemala racist for not wanting me to go into their country without any idea of who I am? Do the Mexicans really hate white people? Because Mexico puts you in prison if you go into their country. They, the, every country that has a enforced border is full of racist bigots, you freaking moron. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. reporting for the media speaks. You can donate to the show at uh, thecorrectviews at hotmail.com. You can also go to themediaspeaks.com. Look up the work of Kyle Court, D. Lake, and myself. We're always posting because...